Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the kickoff of the fifth annual Invasive Species Mapping Challenge. We're really excited to have you all here. Um, I believe everyone's muted right now. I'll ask you to stay muted during the presentation, but you can feel free to enter questions and comments into the chat box as we go along. Um, look for the speech bubble icon on your WebEx window. So I'll introduce myself and the other presenters. It would be great to know a bit more about you all too. So I put some prompts on the right side and you can use those to introduce yourself in the chat box. So as I said, my name is Mitch O'Neill. I'm the end user support specialist with the IMAP team at the New York Natural Heritage Program. And we're very lucky to have some guest presenters today as well. So we have Dr. Anna Stopson, um, postdoc at the Yale School of the Environment. She researches jumping worms. We also have Michael Giambalvo, he is an assistant horticultural inspector with New York Ag and Market, and he works on spotted lanternfly education and outreach. And we also have Dr. Stephen Pearson, a research scientist with the Department of Environmental Conservation, who does a lot of work in the aquatic invasive species realm. And to give you an idea of what we're going to cover today, um, the goal of today's webinar is to have everyone ready to participate in the Invasive Species Mapping Challenge. So we'll go over what the challenge entails. Um, you'll learn how to identify these four focal species on the right and how to report observations to the IMAP Invasive Database. And so this is the agenda. We're going to start, I'm going to give some introduction, and then we're going to have the species ID training, and then I'm going to give a training on IMAP invasives where you will report observations for the challenge. And then we'll have the question period at the end, but again, enter any questions you have into the chat box. So as I said before, I'm with the New York Natural Heritage Program. Our mission is to facilitate the conservation of New York biodiversity. We do a lot of work with rare species. Um, we're a partnership between the New York State DEC and SUNY ESF. Um, but we also recognize the impact of invasive species on biodiversity. So we also have the Invasive Species Database Program. And we're most well known for IMAP invasives. But we also work on some other projects like the Watercraft Inspection Steward Program application and spatial prioritization models to help managers prioritize where they uh, manage invasive species. So to get everyone on the same page, invasive species are species of plants, animals, insects, and pathogens that are non-native, so they come from somewhere outside of New York, and they're negatively impactful, so some sort of harm to the environment, economy, and or human health. In the picture, I have some European frog bit. Um, this is an invasive aquatic plant. So as you can see, those they look like tiny circular leaves on the surface of the water. Um, they've really formed this dense monoculture of frog bit across the surface, um, outcompeting all the native aquatic plants and also shading out um, submerged aquatic plants. Um, so this really changes the ecosystem here. Um, and will have some wide-ranging impacts that Stephen Pearson will talk about later. Um, but it also can make it hard for recreation. So it's hard to boat through um, areas that have aquatic invasive species in them, like aquatic weeds. That's an example of some of the impacts that invasive species can have. Um, so these invasives are a huge problem, but what can we actually do about them? So a lot of work in that question has found that what we do for an invasive species depends on where it is in the invasion curve. Um, so for species that are not here yet, um, this is really the best place to be where you get the most bang for your buck. Um, you would focus on prevention, so not letting the species into the area. Um, and then if there's small populations, um, then the management strategy would be eradication. So if it's manageable to eradicate the small populations, that's what you would want to do so that they can't spread further. Um, and then as 
the species get more widespread, the management strategies change. So once eradication is no longer possible, you'll be focusing on containment. So not letting uh, infestation spread into areas that are not infected. And so to figure out how to choose the invasion the management strategy for any particular invasive species, we really need to understand its current distribution. And as an example of what an invasive species distribution looks like, um, this is the distribution of Tree of Heaven. All those red squares represent a confirmed presence record. Um, so you can see there's some areas in uh, southern New York and western New York Finger Lakes region where Tree of Heaven currently is found. Um, and you'll see these big blank spaces where there are no records. So the question here is what is actually happening there? So has Tree of Heaven not invaded these regions yet? That is possible, um, but it's also possible that we simply have not surveyed for Tree of Heaven here. Um, so we really, uh, there's a need to survey for invasive species across the state. And to fill these mapping needs, um, the Invasive Species Database Program has, it manages IMAP invasives. So IMAP invasives is used by several jurisdictions across uh, North America, and in New York, we use it as the centralized invasive species database to support PRISMs, state agencies, and other partners working on invasive species issues. So IMAP invasives provide species distributions and reports. Um, it provides email alerts for early detection. Um, the data can be used in web map services so that the live data can be displayed on websites and in ArcGIS programs. And we also allow for tracking control efforts and results. And I just mentioned PRISM, so that's an acronym. It's Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. And so I have a map of the eight PRISMs in New York State. So it's divided into these eight part, uh, regional partnerships. Um, you can look at the map to sort of see where you fall. And these prisms do a huge variety of work. I've listed some of the things they do on the left. Um, if you're interested in invasive species, I highly suggest um, figuring out which prism you're in and connecting to them. So find their website. You can join their listserv if you want more information. Um, there's just a lot of resources available to you from these prisms, and I highly encourage anyone interested to check them out. And so, in this IMAP Invasives database, um, where does the data actually come from? So, at the beginning, the main source was existing data from partner organizations, so local, state, and federal agencies, researchers, museums, they had collected invasive species data over the year, and it was um, held by them in some form, and then we sort of aggregated it into this IMAP invasive database. Um, and this provided really great information on invasive species distributions um, at the time that the, these uh, data collections were collected. Um, but since invasive species distributions are constantly changing and we're learning about new invasive species, and they're getting to new areas, we really rely on continuous flow of data into IMAP invasives. And so we really rely on data commuted, uh, data entered by citizen scientists and professionals like the people on this call. Um, so, and I have a picture of a phone there because we've created a app where you can enter records of invasive species and it'll go into our database as unconfirmed. And then we have experts that can go in and review the records, compare the species listed to the photograph attached, and confirm these uh, records. And so now that you know what um, IMAP Invasive is, now I'll explain the mapping challenge that we do. So it's an annual citizen science challenge started in 2016. Um, the First goal is to fill data gaps in IMAP invasives for focal species. Um, so some of those species, there are blank areas that we're trying to fill in our understanding for. 
And then also the broader, more long-term goal is to just generally grow our user group so that we can better monitor invasive species all across New York State. And we're really grateful for everyone on this call and everyone who's interested in participating in the challenge because citizen scientists are really critical in mapping invasive species. So those prisms I mentioned, they do a lot of work surveying invasive species across the state. Um, but there's just so much area to cover, so we really appreciate this and scientists also keeping their eyes out for invasive species. And so why did we pick these four species? So water chestnut has been on part of the challenge for a while. Um, it's, we have it here because we need help finding small, easily manageable populations. So if you find this in a lake or a pond before it's become widespread, um, that's a very good opportunity to do some management and prevent it from becoming widespread there. For the Asian jumping worm, um, we currently, there's a, not a lot of data available for New York State. We need a lot more information to really understand its distribution. And we need this data because it'll help inform decisions such as where to focus conservation efforts or where to install boot brush stations. And then Tree of Heaven is on, the, on our focal species list um, because it's the preferred host of spotted lanternfly, it's a, which is a destructive invasive insect. It's been found in Pennsylvania and it poses a really huge threat to agriculture. Um, and like in the figure I showed earlier, there are some regions in New York State that have very little data. And then European frogbit is new this year. It was recommended by WISPA coordinators and others working with aquatic invasive species. And we added it because there's this suspicion that frogbit is much more widespread than currently known. And I will briefly go through the distributions of these species in New York State. So here's the distribution of water chestnut. As you can see, there's really a lot of areas in New York State where uh, water chestnut has established. So the, the red boxes are confirmed presences. And then we also have these yellow points and polygons which are not detected. So these are places where water chestnut has been surveyed for but not found. So you can see in the Adirondacks, instead of being a blank space, there's all these places where they have looked for water chestnut and it's not there. So we can more confidently say that um, water chestnut is not really in the Adirondacks in the same way that it is in the southern part of the state. Um, but there are still um, some potential data gaps that would be good to fill. And I'll give a really brief one slide overview of water chestnut. Um, so it's an aquatic plant, forms dense mats um, in lakes and ponds, slow moving water up to 15 feet deep. Um, it's, so on top is a picture of the mat, uh, a dense mat that these people are trying to canoe through. And then water chestnut's really distinctive for its rosettes of these sort of diamond shaped leaves with toothed edges. Um, so that's one thing you can look for. Um, you might also see the swelling of the uh, like right below the leaf, that's actually an air pocket where that allows the plant to float. And you might also be familiar with the fruits of this species. So water chestnut nutlets are, have these really sharp spines that can be very painful if you step on them. And the reason I'm giving a brief overview is that this species is part of the challenge, but we're not doing a full ID training like we are getting for all the other species in a couple of minutes. Um, but if you want more details on water chestnut, we did conduct a water chestnut training last year. So that'll be on our uh, YouTube channel. And also PRISMs have a lot of resources on invasive species ID as well. And then, so here's the distribution of jumping worms, um, kind of a spotty distribution, a lot of areas uh, which where we would like to fill data gaps. Tree of Heaven. I'm showing it again because I actually want to highlight some of the efforts across the state. So this is the distribution before it was ever included in the Invasive Species Mapping Challenge. And then this is after. 
So you can see we started to fill in some of the data gaps, um, but there's still quite a ways to go. And to sort of show you what our goal might be, I've added in the data from Pennsylvania. Um, so here you can see they've surveyed it in a lot of places and in the locations where they surveyed for it but didn't find it, they put in these not detected records, um, which really helps in understanding the distribution of this species. And then the new species this year, European frogbit. So it's over in the northeastern part of the state and then kind of found in a smattering of locations elsewhere. And uh, there's really some suspicion that it could be a lot more widespread than the distribution here suggests. And uh, that's an example of some of the data gaps we'd like to fill. And just to sort of show you where some of the species might fall, uh, so spotted lanternfly um, isn't here yet, so we're in prevention phase. The other species are here yet, so we're more towards the middle. Um, and this can also be viewed um, scale dependent. So in some lakes, water chestnut might be very widespread, whereas in other lakes, um, it might be very small populations or not even there yet. And so how do you participate in the challenge? So the challenge starts today um, and it goes for three weeks. So you go out and look for the focal invasive species. Uh, we'll tell you how to do that later with the species ID training. And then you report your observations to IMAP invasive. So both presence and not detected records will count and we'll cover this later. And so how the challenge works, for each species, the top contributing individual will be the first place winner, and the top contributing prism will receive a trophy for that species. And you can go to newyorkimapinvasive.org for live maps and a leaderboard to see your standing and your prism standing um, in the challenge. Um, since there's no data yet, this is not, this web page is not really informative, um, but check back next week and there will be some more updates. Um, and one thing I'll mention, so historically, um, the top winning, the top contributing individual for each species um, would also get the prize. Um, this year, because of COVID-related budget constraints, we are not going to be able to purchase gifts. So the only thing I can promise you right now is bragging rights. Um, but we really appreciate everyone who's participating in this, and we hope you're still excited to participate in the challenge. And with that, I would also, in the picture on the right, those are, I think, our 2018 winners, the PRISM winners. So there's the trophies for um, jumping worm on the left with the little jumping worms crawling around and the water chestnut trophy on the right. And here is where I'll hand it off to Anis to train you on identifying jumping worms. How's my audio? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sounds good. Fantastic. You can skip ahead to the next slide. All right, so I'm going to start you guys off with a little bit of history of earthworms in New York State, uh, because this is one thing that first kind of got me interested in them. So in New York, uh, we have a few small pockets of native earthworms that are living in bogs and living um, in streams. But for the most part, the worms that you're seeing are going to be um, non-native species. And why this is important is that forests in New York have established over the last you know, 10, 11,000 years in the absence of earthworms. And they do a lot. Um, so most of the earthworms that you see now in New York are going to be coming Europe around for several centuries, but more recently, uh, the jumping worms coming from Asia have shown up on the scene. Let me skip ahead. All right, so what we have here is just a little schematic of what a historical forest in New York might have looked like on the left, and then a forest that's been modified by earthworms on the right. So on the left, um, the key thing is that the amount of leaves and um, nutrients coming into the system is more than what's being used up by the system. So you get this organic duff layer building up. 
And that duff layer is, is so critical to New York ecosystems. It, it, it's um, the habitat for all of the understory plants and the trees have to germinate there and move through it. All of the soil fauna and things like that, all of the birds and the salamanders, not all of the birds, many of the birds and the salamanders rely on this, um, this top layer of the soil. When earthworms come, is they consume that organic horizon, the duff layer on the top, they mix it up. Um, and, um, and you have a much less diverse system that's quite homogenous and doesn't, um, doesn't facilitate the same growth of the same um, native understory species. Now with jumping worms, in addition to that, it's not just mixed, the nutrients aren't just lost from the system. Uh, but what you have is this very crumbly surface um, of castings that's really, really hard for anything to grow in. Next slide. So what we call, we call these uh, jumping worms the second wave, and that's because the European lumbricid species, so that's a different family of earthworms, showed up earlier. Um, and these new showing up and displacing the earlier invasions. Um, so they come from East Asia, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, um, 16 species in North America, five that move into forests, but there's three main ones that are in New York State. And because this invasion was sort of um, slowly observed they, uh, in a bunch of different places, they have a bunch of different names. So Jersey Wigglers, Alabama Jumpers, Georgia Jumpers, Snake Worm, Crazy Worm, Asian Worm, um, and then the scientific names megascolecid and phoretomoid. But I think that jumping worms is sort of a good one to agree on. It's very descriptive and is not um, confusing and in inaccurate like a lot of the other ones. Next slide. So the main thing that for jumping worms um, is, the, is the change in soil texture that I and so people have described described this as looking like coffee grounds, looking like gravel, beef. Um, there are these big chunks of soil, big aggregates that don't stick very well to each other. So it's kind of like plants trying to grow in gravel. Um, and what you see, especially on slopes, is huge erosion away from roots. Well, so all of the leaves can be eaten up sort of by the end of the summer. Um, and then these crumbly gravel-like chunks that you see on the right. Next slide. And what this means is that they have a really, really hard time germinating and growing and establishing when they're having a light spongy uh, surface to grow on. Now they're trying to grow in this gravel-like um, substrate. And so they dry out, they fall over, um, and and so you'll see a huge loss of diversity. Important um, in combination with some of the other stressors that we have in New York, white-tailed. Um, and some of the plots that I've been following, the understory plants can, can manage um, growing with jumping worms reasonably well, growing with deer reasonably well. But when you have both of those stressors together, you can rapidly completely lose um, populations of understory plants. Next slide. Um, you might golf courses in parks, um, any grassland type habitat. Um, you get the, the pebbly structure building up and the grass die offs. So that, that is a bit of a problem. Next slide. And I won't go into the whole system, but just know that their impacts uh, ricochet up through the food chain, salamanders, birds, um, all sorts of other reliant on um, the understory habitat and the, the fauna living there. Next slide. All right, so on to the ID section. Um, the first thing that you're going to look for is the soil. So on the left, there's, there's still a, a number of forests in New York State that don't have big earthworm populations. So that's where you might see the building up, slowly decomposing leaves. 
Um, with European species, it looks quite mixed, a little bit more like garden soil. So with jumping worms, that's where you get this really distinctive, pebbly soil. And this is really important because um, the worm is visible. Oh, no, that's good. Next slide. <laughs> the worms aren't going to be visible all year round. They're only really quite visible June, July, August, a little bit. In, but you can see the soil all year round. In the summer, uh, we are now and going a little bit later, we'll see the actual worms themselves. Um, so and I'll just put in a plug here, move on that if you're putting in your observation to map either a presence or um, affected, it would be a great idea to include the soil as well, because that's really quite distinctive and you can even usually tell that from the picture. Next slide. You can visually inspect for jumping worms um, at this time of year and into the early fall. They are living pretty close to the surface, maybe right under last year's leaves, but you usually don't have to dig down very far. You'll see them sort of grow, living like this, a little bit under the ground, a little bit above, especially in wet areas. Next slide. All right, so these are some videos. So I think that you're gonna have to play them for me. Just click on, just click on them. Hopefully it works. Okay, no luck. That's fine. Um, <laughs> so basically the jumping worms, how they move is they thrash their body back and forth. Um, kind of like, um, kind of like a snake would move over the ground. Um, and then the lumbricid, the European earthworms, um, they move by expanding and contracting their setae. So they move sort of more um, horizontally across the soil versus jumping worms that really thrash. All right. It's uh anyway, so these these I will at box these videos, um, the links to them if you want to go in and look close. Oh it's gonna work. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So there you can see um, depending on how strong your internet is, <laughs> how they thrash back and forth. And the ones, I want you to take note of the ones that are escaping out of the container and how they move, how they sort of skirt along the surface, quite like you would imagine a snake trying. And then if you want to play the European worm. So the European worms aren't always necessarily moving this slowly. This is kind of a nice leisurely worm, but what I want you to take note of, so expanding and contracting their setae um, as they move thrashing back and forth. And they also, one thing to notice is that they use their tail, so they'll flatten their tail a little bit. It looks kind of like a beaver tail, especially when they're in motion, the European species, and that's the jumping worms. So those I'll I'll still put those videos up in the uh, up in the back box for you to look at in your own time if you want to watch them again. Um, really quick, not necessary for IMAP reporting, but if you want to be quantitative and be able to compare between people, you can do a mustard sampling. This is just ground mustard mixed with water, known concentration, known volume of solution over a known area, and then you can. Um, pick the worms up, you can fix them to look at them under a microscope if you want to identify them to species. Uh, but we won't, we won't spend too much time on this um, because this is after all for IMAP. Next slide. All right, so this is, this is kind of what an adult jumping worm will look like this starting around now. Uh, dark pigmentation, iridescent, um, and they're starting to get quite big. Next slide. Um, one thing that is easy to tell 
between the European species and the jumping worms. If you see that they're mature, sexually mature, you can see the female reproductive structures. So um, on the jumping worm, it's going to be this clitellum that's pretty close to the head and sort of the first 10% of the body. Um, it's going to be usually clear or sort of rosy pink. Uh, and it's going to go all the way around the body of the worm. So then on the left, if you're looking at the European species, the clitellum is closer to the middle, usually about a third of the way down. Um, it's going to keep its segments, so the segments will still be visible. Um, and it's more, it's, it's just on the back of the worm. So if you'll click for me, I give an easy way to remember. So the European species, the clitellum kind of looks like a saddle, it's just on the back of the worm. Whereas on the jumping worm, it's more like a corset. It goes, uh, slims along the body all the way around um, and is sort of flush with, flush with the worm. Next slide. Um, if you have a hand lens, you can identify um, the juveniles easily enough too. The European worms have these setae, these little appendages um, along the segments that are paired. Uh, versus in the jumping worms, they go all the way around, like somewhat like bristles. So the picture on the left, that's sort of looking down the barrel of the worm, and then uh, the picture on the right is what you might actually see. Hard to see with your naked eye, but um, hand lens, it's possible. Next slide. Um, this key I'll put up if you want to ID to um, species, but for IMAP and for a lot of my research, mostly just thinking about them as a, as a family is as far as we need to go. They're quite difficult to identify to species. All right, so then in uploading to IMAP, next slide. Um, it would be great if you could take multiple images for confirmation. Um, dispose the worms in the freezer or in ethanol. Don't let them back into the ecosystem. Um, and if it, these these ID these observations come directly to me, so any observations or comments that you have will be really helpful. I've gotten a lot of cool insight into jumping worms that I never thought of from anglers and from people that have chickens about how their chickens and their fish um, interact with jumping worms. Um, and it's all really interesting. So any other info that you have, comments, and um, I'd love to see it next. Um, so it's a good idea to include a picture, again, of the casting of the soil. Mature specimens, if you can. Um, good resolution. Cell phones are usually good enough for that. Um, if you can include something for scale, a ruler if you have it, or something standardized like a coin. Um, contrasting background, um, IMAP last year, they recommended a little takeout container, which is actually really helpful. It kind of keeps the worm in place. Um, straightening the worm can be really helpful. And uh, fewer worms is, is better than more. So a big bucket of worms is quite tricky to ID, but one or two um, is ideal. Next slide. So you can, for, for IMAP purposes, for my education visually is good enough. Look for the soil, look for the thrashing behavior. If they're mature, you can look for that corset like clitellum near the head of the body. Um, if you have a hand lens, that's where you can look for the bristle like setae. Next slide. And then just really quickly, some prevention steps. Um, the main way that jumping worms get spread is through mud, through potted plants, through mulch and compost, and through bait. Um, so just make sure that you're that you are um, minimize transport these things between sites, um, and always check your potted plants, um, clean your wheels, clean your boots bet between moving between an invaded and uninvaded site. All right, and I'm going to pass it over with that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anis. Um, we are having a couple technical difficulties. So for now, I'm going to get past the tree of heaven and go to European frog bit. Um, so Stephen, I hope uh, you're able to start your presentation now, um, and then we'll go back to the tree of heaven after that.
a bit too far. Oh, here we are. Perfect. All right, so Mitch, can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, I can. All right, great. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. I'm Stephen Pearson here to talk about European Frog Bit. Uh, so European Frog Bit is native to uh, Europe, Northern Asia, and you can see all those uh, in, in that region where it is native in the figure on the top left. And in North America, well, in the United States, is what's shown in the introduced range in the bottom left. And you can see it's, a, it's a across the uh, eastern Great Lakes region, and it goes up into Canada as well, but we're just showing the United States here. And in New York, you can see that, uh, as Mitch had shown earlier with the IMAP distribution, it's, it's well known from uh, Western New York and uh, the Northern, you know, Northeastern New York, Lake Champlain and upper uh, Hudson uh, River Valley. Next slide, please. So as far as identifying this plant, you will mostly, have, you'll be looking for floating leaves. The leaves will be heart-shaped, as you can see in the figure here. Uh, if you approach it and you can get up to it you, and you touch it, you'll find that they're leathery, so they're a little thick um, leaf, and they're free-floating. So when you pick them up, uh, they may be tangled to one another, but they typically will not have rooted into the substrate. This is even, even in shallow areas, they typically will, will not have rooted. The root systems are well developed. And as I mentioned, not normally rooted, but occasionally they may, they may appear rooted. And the tangled aspect of European frog bit comes from these uh, stolons or the runners that they send out as a form of spreading. And so those runners will uh, intermingle with one another and form those dense mats uh, that make it really difficult to paddle through or um, to um, have the larger impacts on the ecosystem. When you find this plant in flower, it's dioecious, so it has both female and male plants. And on both of them, the flowers uh, will have three petals, three white petals, as you can see in that figure. And then they'll have three greenish red sepals below those petals. Uh, so that's what you'll be looking for as you are out in the wetlands looking and water bodies looking for uh, European frog bit. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of habitat, where should you look for European frog bit? Uh, it is a perennial wetland plant, so um, if you found it there last year and it hasn't been managed, uh, you can go back there. However, we are looking for uh, new populations and to broaden our understanding of its distribution. Uh, it overwinters as turions, so they can produce up to 150 turions per plant. And in the fall, those fall off and sink, and then in the spring, they'll rise to the surface and begin growing. So this all occurs within slow moving water. So in larger water bodies, it will be in bays, it could be uh, fully across uh, ponds or anywhere within a pond as long as it's not flowing. Open marshes, so that could be very shallow uh, water dif that's difficult to get to. However, you may be able to uh, access on foot rather than on boat. Roadside ditches or irrigation ditches are good places to look. 
as well as if you're out paddling or boating along the protected edges of lakes and rivers. And the figure that is shown on this slide uh, shows the water chestnut in those shallows uh, right along the edge of a wetland. And you can see that, it, that it's going back to all the little coves uh, of that water body. So when you are out and you're looking for uh, small populations of European frogbit, it's good to get along the edge and uh, to see in all these crevices within a uh, wetland if, uh, if the frogbit is interspersed amongst the other uh, edge or emergent vegetation that you're talking to. Places to look for frog bit would be uh, within the emergent vegetation uh, where plants could have blown by the wind, they are floating. So they'll get tangled up in these other plants uh, as well. So that's uh, always going to be a good spot to start if you don't see huge beds of it, paddle or move along the edge of emergent vegetation and look for plants that are tangled up within, within those. Next slide. As far as impacts from European frog bit, uh, they can be numerous. As with many other uh, or emergent plants, you uh, aquatic plants, you can have uh, impacts from competition. So they can compete for space with other plants. And in the process, as their pockets become those dense mats, they'll end up shading out the plants below them. As these populations grow, they can uh, dominate them and become uh, a huge nuisance within, within. As far as impacts to wildlife, they decrease the plant uh, below the surface which can lead to altered oxygen levels, which can impact fish and invertebrates. Uh, they, it can also, it is edible for some species, so it may provide some food and cover for, for other species as well. There are both social and economic impacts on the, uh, and under that category, there's both uh, recreational activities can be hampered, uh, including boating, both motorized and uh, non-motorized type boating can be impacting. Uh, fishing, I, most people don't want to fish in tangled mess of, uh, of frog bit. They'll end up losing a lot of lures or hooks or getting caught. And swimming, it can definitely impede on your ability to swim. And so that, that, and those have economic impacts as well. And in the ditch or the irrigation canals, it can limit flow, which can impact uh, agricultural um, purposes as well. So I think that's it for my slide, Mitch. Oh, sorry, one more on management and control. So it is possible to control water, uh, I'm sorry, uh, European frog bit, uh, depending on both the size and location. Some of these locations, as I mentioned, are uh, tangled in the very shallow areas of, of wetlands. So it is uh, quite difficult to manage, uh, but it can be done. And the options are hand pulling, uh, so that's manual control. That's where, you know, we get out there and uh, physically remove the, this plant as much of it as possible. Uh, mechanical, if it's in wide open areas and you can get in with a harvester, you could use a harvester. Uh, chemical herbicide use is possible. There, there aren't great options uh, for this plant, but uh, it is uh, possible. 
a more holistic approach is to uh, reduce nutrients into a system. So oftentimes frog bit uh, likes high nutrient loads and you can find it in areas where there's a uh, high nutrient load above the natural system. Uh, as in shorelines uh, with planting, you can reduce those loads and uh, reduce the the All right, thank you, Steve, for presenting earlier than planned. Um, so hopefully next we will go back to Tree of Heaven. Uh, Michael from Ag and Markets, are you there? Let me see if I need to unmute. Give me a minute. Um, I Hi. have unmuted. Yes. Hi, it's Michael. Hi, great. We can hear you now. Let me get to your first slide. Okay. The floor is yours. All right. So I'm going to talk about Tree of Heaven. It's a very widespread invasive tree in our environment in New York and most of the eastern U.S. There's a lot of new interest in mapping its occurrence because it is the primary and preferred host of a relatively newly introduced invasive insect called the spotted lanternfly. And that could, of course, be damaging to several agricultural crops and also our quality of life. Next slide. Um, so, its native range is in China and Taiwan, which is also similar to the spotted lanternfly's native range. And despite its name, it doesn't really like to grow in very heavenly places. It likes poor soils, industrial areas where I took some of those photos on that slide, and uh, just generally disturbed areas. Um, it can actually break through foundations of buildings when it grows close to buildings like that. And it's also kind of hard to kill once once it's there. It's, it's kind of a pain to get rid of. So <clears throat> next slide. That's the spotted lanternfly. Um, it has four different morphs before it becomes an adult with wings. Um, and they, they don't necessarily fly that far, but they're plant hoppers, so they, they can hop pretty far. Next slide. It's a pretty large tree. In that photo I took, most of those taller trees are tree of heaven, and then there are some smaller clumps of trees growing in front. Uh, which the, the adults are shooting up from their roots. Next slide. Tree of Heaven has an alternate leaf arrangement. Um, if you look in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, you can see the difference between an opposite leaf arrangement, an alternate leaf arrangement, and a world leaf arrangement. And that's, so that's one of the identifying characteristics when you're looking to map this tree. Next slide. Tree of Heaven has pinnately compound leaves, uh, which you could also see the difference between uh, com the two different types of compound leaves in the upper right-hand corner. <clears throat> Next slide. The leaflet shape is fairly unique. It has smooth margins, and then it has those two small lobes at the base of each leaflet. So it's, it's one leaf made up of many leaflets. And 
Another very unique characteristic about Tree of Heaven's leaflets are the glands that are present on those small lobes at the base of each leaflet that actually have um, a fairly foul odor. I can't really describe it, but it's, it's not very nice. Next slide. The flowers are, some could say they're inconspicuous. I think they're actually kind of showy once they're, when there's a lot of the trees in the area. Um, and they are dioecious, meaning that separate individuals are male and female. They don't have both male and female parts on the same tree. Um, I believe the flowers on the left are the female flowers and the ones on the right are the male flowers in those pictures. Next slide. The seeds can be kind of showy when they turn that pink yellowish color. And that's when I usually notice them when I'm driving on highways is when they, they have that bright colored fruit on them. And that fruit can actually persist on the tree through the winter. Um, it, it'll, it turns brown eventually, but it stays on there. And all those seeds spread, can spread fairly far and spread the invasive species. So that's one of the ways it spreads. Next slide. The pith, I would say, is also a very unique characteristic when trying to identify Tree of Heaven. Um, once you break open a twig, it has that soft, light brown pith, kind of corky, and it also has a unique smell that some say smells like burnt peanut butter, and it kind of looks like it too, strangely. Next slide. Another characteristic is the bark, which is smooth, but has that kind of cantaloupe furrowing in it. And that always helps me remember uh, what the bark looks like, the, the cantaloupe description. Next slide. Here I have a picture of a tree of heaven twig on the left and on the right, there are comparisons between some of its lookalike twigs. So walnut has a similar leaf scar, um, and then tree of heaven, and then sumac, which is another lookalike, its twig is fairly different, as well as uh, horse chestnut, which has a similar leaf scar, but very different bud on the end. Next slide. So its number one lookalike, I would say, is sumac, which grows right next to it. In the picture on the left, on the right, um, in the foreground, there's sumac, and then high above it, which is tree of heaven, which usually grows much taller. And on the left, there's a comparison to of the leaf shapes. So they're both pinnately compound. Um, tree of Heaven, because of, it can get to a larger size, it also usually can get a larger leaf. Next slide. There's just another look at sumox leaf. Um, its leaflets are different in that they don't have the lobes at the base of each leaflet or the glands, and the margin, the edge of the leaf, is more rough with a serrated edge rather than a smooth edge that like Tree of Heaven has. Next slide. Another way to tell the difference between sumac, which is native, and tree of heaven, the invasive species, is the sap that it exudes when broken. So there in that picture, I have uh, the milky sap of sumac coming out of the base of the leaflet, and then right next to it, a freshly broken off tree of heaven leaflet, which you can't really tell that there's any sap coming out. Next slide. Another look like because of the leaf, the pinnately compound leaf and the leaf scar on the twig is walnut. And the spotted lanternfly 
will feed on this tree as well. Usually in one of its earlier life stages, it, it, it likes to feed on immature black walnut in particular. I don't have a picture here, but black walnut has a very uh, distinct fruit because it's a walnut. It has round green fruits that the, the hulls actually smell fairly citrusy. Um, so that's a dead giveaway that it's not tree of heaven if you're looking at that. Next slide. Some would say ash because of its pinnately compound leaf is another look-alike to Tree of Heaven, but as you can see from the leaf comparison pictures, the Tree of Heaven leaf can get many more leaflets and a longer leaf. Next slide. Here I just put some interesting facts about Tree of Heaven and its history uh, in this hemisphere because I thought it might be a good way to remember it when you're in, out looking for it. <clears throat> it was one of the reasons it was brought to this country was so a species of silk moth could feed on it, uh, but I don't think that worked out. Uh, it's also the subject of the novel A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. And there is a native species in the Western United States that grows in the deserts, but it looks very different. Next slide. So the spotted lanternfly, which prefers to feed on the tree of heaven, is native to China and Southeastern Asia, just like tree of heaven. Um, it was discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014 and uh, is infesting, it's spreading to many more counties than where it was found. So we're concerned of it spreading to New York. Um, it doesn't, according to a recent Rutgers study, it doesn't need Tree of Heaven to complete its life cycle. It can feed on other species uh, to complete its life cycle. So it doesn't need Tree of Heaven, but it usually will go to Tree of Heaven at some point in its life cycle to feed, which so, looking at tree of heaven in your environment is also a good way to spot spotted lanternfly and detect it before we are infested with it. Next slide. So here are some life stages of spotted lanternfly. Its eggs are kind of like a a little bit of mud is what they look like when they're covered up. And they'll lay those eggs on almost anything. They like rusty metal, cars, uh, any flat surface really. So that's something to keep an eye out for. It will lay those eggs on tree of heaven bark where it kind of blends in. <clears throat> Next slide. So you can report Tree of Heaven on IMAP invasives, but if you think you've seen any signs of spotted lanternfly, feel free to contact our email address, uh, try and collect a specimen if possible, take photos, and give us details of the location. All right, thank you so much, Michael, and um, all of our other guest presenters for their species um, ID training. Um, if anyone has any questions about these species, feel free to enter these into the chat box and we will uh, go through those at the end. Um, so we've gone through our focal species ID and now I'm going to give a uh, training on how to report these species. Um, so now you know how to actually find them. Um, now I'm going to show you how to report them into IMAP invasive. And now, uh, before I start, I want to make clear the difference between um, online, the online web application and the mobile app. So the online web application is the browser-based interface um, 
So you can access that on your computer or with your mobile phone, anywhere you have internet, and you can get onto this website um, where you can view the IMAP and MESA's data and you can also enter records. Um, but you can only do that with connectivity. So we've also made this mobile app where you can collect simple um, presence and not detected data from your mobile phone or tablet. And you can do this without um, connectivity. So if you're out in the field and you don't have internet. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about the online web application because you need to use this to set up your account. And in general, always use uh, Chrome or Firefox. Um, and you can also use Safari if you're on a, a Mac computer or an iPhone, um, but Internet Explorer does not work well. And so anyone who's interested, um, they, anyone who wants to set up their account or wants to check on their account, you can follow along here. Um, you need to go into a browser, so you could go on your phone if you want to keep the screen up to watch the webinar. Um, so the first thing you do is have to get to the IMAP Invasive's website, um, the login page. One easy way to get there is going to nyimapinvasive.org. Um, and then on the top, there's a login and create account button that will bring you to the right page. And it will bring you to this imapinvasive.natureserve.org. So it brings you to this login page. Um, if you have an account already, or maybe you made one a while ago, you would use this login bar at the top to put in your um, email and password. Um, if your password's not working, hit this forget pa forgot pa password button. Um, you might also have to hit this if you haven't logged in in a while since we updated the database last spring. Um, so if you've created an account before, use that login box at the top. If you have not created an account, um, use this sign up box below and enter in your name and your email and your password and type in and select New York for your jurisdiction if you're collecting data in New York. Um, if you get an error message here um, saying that there's already an account, um, that means you probably made one a while ago and you would want to go back up to the login and do a forgot password. Um, but in general, if you're signing up, you put in information, press join, um, that'll send an email to the email you chose. Um, so if you go into your inbox, you'll find an email from my map and bases and it'll have a link in there that says click here. And using that, you open up the user agreement and press agree um, after reading it. Um, and if you're not finding this email, sometimes it ends up in the spam box. Um, so make sure to check there. And if you're still not finding this email and you can't activate your account, um, please let me know and we can figure that out. And I'll put up my email at the end as well. And feel free to enter any uh, issues you're having into the chat box. And I will say, um, once you have um, created your account, um, then you use the, the login button, the login bar at the top. If you try to use the sign up more than once, you'll get an error. And so um, once you log in, once you have your account and you log in, you'll be brought to this page. Um, there's always a box that pops up with any updates. You can X that out once you've read it. And then the screen looks like this. And just to give a very brief orientation of where everything is, um, there is the main menu on the top left, the navigation buttons on the left side. So zooming in and out, uh, you can search a town or a park or a water body. And on the top, we have action tools. Um, you could create a record online. Um, you can filter the records that you're seeing. Um, you could make species list reports. And then on the right side are the geographic layers. So this is where you control what's showing up on the map. So um, whether you want to be seeing confirmed presences, not to text, treatments, et cetera. And we're going to start with the main menu. Um, so hopefully everyone who's following along has gotten to this point uh, to being logged into IMAP and bases. 
and you can click on the menu on the top left. Um, and I, so the reason I'm bringing you into this, uh, the menu, um, is one of the options is your account. And if you click on that, you can look at your account and this is where you can join projects and organizations um, if that's relevant to you. So the way, so organizations are in IMAP, um, the sort of group data associated with certain organizations. So if you're doing invasive species surveys or management as a part of your job duties, you should probably join your employer's organization. Um, but for those of you who are citizen scientists and volunteers uh, participating in the challenge or uh, mapping species as you go about in the world, um, you do not need an organization. Um, and then projects are similar to organizations. Um, they're a great way to group invasive species work under a project or a grant. Um, and these are great um, for volunteers, um, mapping efforts across organizations, PRISM coordinated volunteer efforts. Um, so you don't need to join a project, but you just might want to be aware of them. Um, your PRISM might be doing some sort of mapping project and having volunteers join that project so that their data is all together. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, so if you do want to join an organization or project, just to briefly go through how that can be done, um, you on that user account page, you click edit on the top right, and then scroll down to either projects or organizations. And once you click edit, this little request to join button will pop up. And so at that point, you can type in the project or organization. Um, and once you type it in and select which project or organization you were looking for, you click request to join and press save um, at the top right corner. And you really have to pr press save because that'll save you as a pending member of the organization, and then someone from that organization will have to uh, go in and accept you. And then one other optional thing I'd like to mention um, is these email alerts. So these are important features that were set up that so that state officials would be alerted to observations of key species like spotted lanternfly. Um, but really everyone can use these alerts to stay informed on any species or areas that they're interested in. For instance, um, if you live in the capital region prism, like I do, and you're interested in European frog bit, you could set up an email alert for um, observations of European frog bit in the capital region. And the way you would do that is on the main menu, right under your account, there's a your email alert option. And so you can opt in and out of general email alerts, um, such as alert me when a record I created has been updated. Um, so this first one, if I um, edited and then added this as a green little check mark, if I check the box, um, then I would get email alerts whenever my records have been confirmed. So that's always interesting to see. And you can also set up custom alerts, like the, a specific species in a some sort of county or prism or conservation area. And so as long as you made an IMAP account and you were able to log in, um, you are all ready for the next step, which is the mobile app training. Um, so you don't need to join organizations, projects, and email alerts um, necessarily. Those are just things you should be aware of if you're interested or if you are required to join an organization by your employer. Um, so any questions you can enter into the chat box and um, we will do the questions at the end as well. And so I'm, so this is what the app looks like. You search it in your app store, uh, search IMAP Invasives and you'll find the app that looks like this. And here I'm going to ask everyone to follow along and I'm actually going, oh, well, before I do that, I'll just briefly frame the workflow as a sandwich. So top slice of bread, um, you need connectivity. So you need to have internet to set up your IMAP Invasive account and app. And then in the meat of the sandwich, you don't need internet connection anymore. So you can go out into the field and collect invasive species. 
um, but it will be only saved on your phone. So to really complete the workflow, you have to go back into connectivity for the bottom slice of bread and upload your record to the IMAP database. And we're going to start, uh, we've already set up the IMAP account, so now it's um, setting up and configuring your app. So I'm going to do a live demo where we set the preferences. Um, we'll all record an observation of fake species to make sure it's working. And we will upload um, observations at the end. Um, so I am going to switch. I'm going to share the screen of my tablet, so just give me one second. Right, it's loading now. You're going to see my tablet screen right there, and I'll look for my IMAP app. It's that same little logo with a leaf. So I click on IMAP Invasive, and so it the opening screen will look different for some people. So some people will be brought directly into their preferences. Um, so just hold on if you're in there already. For those of you who open up to a screen like this, um, I'll show you how to get into the preferences. So click the menu on the top left, the three white bars, looks like a hamburger, and select preferences. And so this is how you uh, link your app to your online account. So you select your jurisdiction, I've typed in my email address and my password. Um, and so these have to be the same as your, um, as what you chose on uh, when you were setting up your account. And then so really important is to click this retrieve IMAP list, it's highlighted in green so that you remember to click it. So this is really the, the first thing you need to do. Um, don't even worry about the settings underneath until you retrieved IMAP list. So I'll click that green button in the middle. And then, so it's doing a live call to um, the IMAP Invasive database um, to get my account information. And so it pulled in the projects and organizations I'm associated with and uh, the species list for my jurisdiction. And so it should be this green message that says I'm, that says you're successful. Um, if you have that, you are all set to go. If you're getting some sort of error message, usually that's because your username and password um, aren't matching what's on the online database. Um, sometimes your iPhone will add a space after the password. Um, sometimes there's just typos. So make sure you can log in online and then carefully type out your password again to make sure it works. I'm going to hit OK, and now I'm able to uh, report records um, to IMAP Invasive, um, but there are also some extra preferences you can set to make using the app easier. So you can select between, at the top, um, scientific versus common names. I'm just going to leave it on common since I think it's easier to remember common names. So. I'm going to hit this customized species list. You can all hit this too. So this brings up tons of species. Um, it's a lot to scroll through. Um, to save time when you're out in the field, you can actually make a shorter list from these species um, so that you'll pull up the list and be able to pick your species more quickly. So I'm going to scroll through and add all of the species we've been trained on today. So in alphabetical order, the first one is European frog bit. So scroll down to the E's. And if you see any other species you're familiar with or interested in, you can click on those to keep them in your short list too. I'm going to scroll down to the E's for European frog bit right here. Um, the next species is actually fake species. Um, so we use this to 
um, do test records. So I highly recommend everyone to this so that they can do a test record. Next is jumping worm. So go down to the J's. Jumping worms. Next is tree of heaven. So down to the T's. Tree of heaven. And then water chestnut. Oops, went down too far. Water chestnut. And so um, if you find a species in the field that's not on this list, um, Actually, I'll go over that later, so hold that up. So I'll press OK on these species. Um, for picture quality, I think that yours will be set to 50. By default, you could switch to 100 for highest quality photos. And then below here, there are more uh, settings that you could change. Um, in general, I don't really change them. The defaults are fine. Um, and then if you had joined a project, um, you could join that here, or you could select a default project here, um, where it says default project. Um, if your project is not showing up, um, it might be because the last time you pressed this retrieve IMAP list was before you actually joined the project. Um, so just make sure you are in the project or organization in IMAP online, and then refresh um, the app by clicking Retrieve IMAP List. And then the same goes for your organization, if that's relevant to you. And then if you made a custom species list or anything, you really have to hit this Save button on the bottom left to save any of your changes. So that brings you to this green screen. Um, so you have to do all that in connectivity. And now, in theory, you can go out um, into somewhere without connectivity and record a species. So there's that green ad observation on the top right. I encourage everyone to follow along to make sure your app's working. So ad observation, and that brings you to this screen. Um, the first thing that comes up is to take a photo. Um, I'll just take a photo of my computer and press the checkbox. And so now the photo should appear there. And then the next thing under pictures is this uh, species custom list. So if I had that unchecked when I try to select species, it's a very long list that's hard to scroll through. Um, if I check it, then it's my short list of the species I'm more interested in. Um, and so say you missed a couple species on your custom list, um, it's no big deal because you could, could just uncheck custom list to get that full species again, that full species list again. And I'll also note that you could go in and change your custom list whenever you want. I'll keep my custom list for now. And I'm going to scroll down to fake species for testing because this is not a real record. Um, so under that is where you select species detected or species not detected. So whether or not you found it, I'll say species detected. And that's what most of the records that come in are. And then as you scroll down right now, you'll see a map probably has some roads and water bodies uh, near your location. Um, I will note that if you're out in the wilderness without connectivity, this might appear like blank gray. That doesn't necessarily mean it's not working. It just means it's not retrieving that map information. Um, but as long as you have a nice long number here for location, so underneath the map, there's your longitude and latitude. Um, so as long as there's a nice long number, then your location services are working. However, if it says zero, zero, that means you're, you have not enabled GPS on your device or IMAP is not able to access your location services. Um, so that's something you'll need to fix in your settings on your phone. 
And then there's some more fields that you can enter down here. Um, so if you have a project or organization, you can change those. I'm just gonna have no project or organization for this record. Um, and so for time search, it could be how much time you spent. Uh, so if you were just walking down the trail and you saw a tree of heaven, um, you would not need to fill in time search because it's just an in incidental finding. Um, but if you did some sort of like, uh, you went to the shore of a lake and visually inspected uh, 20 square feet or something, um, and you looked for five minutes and you did not see water chestnut, then you would put a uh, time search here. Um, so if you're doing any sort of like more focused search on a specific species, then you can put that there. Um, you could also select the size of the infestation. Um, so this is all just visually estimating. We don't expect anyone to be measuring infestations. You can just uh, sort of eyeball whether it's smaller than 10 feet or um, up to half an acre, et cetera. And I think a football field is larger than an acre. I think a football field might be about two acres. Um, so you could look for examples like that to help you visualize um, what these different area measurements are. And you can also pick distribution of the invasive. Um, so that's just another visual. Is it linearly scattered across the trail? Is it a monoculture? Is it just occurring in small clumps? And then here's this observation comment at the bottom. And so, like Annis mentioned earlier, this is for anything you want us to know. So, um, if you used that mustard technique Annis mentioned, you could write that in here. Um, if you notice the worm doing that snake motion, you could enter that in here. Um, anything that you feel was not captured in these comments. Um, if you're doing a, uh, not to, if you're entering a not detector record, you could also enter in here what the habitat was um, so that we know you're searching in the correct habitat. For instance, um, if you're entering a not detected or frog bit, um, you would really need to be searching in slow moving water. We wouldn't really want a record in um, like a fast moving river or stream because that's not necessarily where we would expect to find European frog bit anyway. And so once you are done with your record, you can enter this save at the bottom. And once you hit save, it should bring you back to the main screen and the record will appear as a yellow card. And so this is just on your phone right now. Um, so this needs to be uploaded to the database for it to be used in IMAP Invasive. So I could hit that little pencil icon if I wanted to uh, edit the record, but for now I will hit the checkbox underneath the pencil icon to denote that it's ready. And so I will go into the menu at the top left, the three white lines that look like a hamburger, and there's an option for upload selected. I, if I had a bunch of records to submit, I could also use select all, so I don't have to check them off individually. Um, but once you have them checked off, you can click this upload selected. And actually before I submit it, oops, looks like I might have hit okay. Um, yeah, I hit okay. But once you hit okay, it'll upload the record. And then it says visit IMAP3 online and log in to view your uploaded records. Um, that's optional. That's only if you want to view them. So um, now your screen should be blank. And again, I'll mention that this has to be when you're back in connectivity. So after you get home from searching for invasives and you're in internet connection again, then you can upload your record. Um, so now your screen should be blank. And that means that the record has left your phone and now it's in the IMAP Invasives online database. And so that's how far you really need to get. Um, 
one thing I'll mention is that at my first training, my species card was red instead of yellow, and it wouldn't let me upload it. And so I went in to edit it and fix it, and it turned out that I forgot to select a species. So if anyone has a red card, make sure you go back in with that little pencil icon and select your species. And uh, I really just want to emphasize how important that last step of uploading records is. And now I will switch back to my presentation for a brief conclusion. Give me one second to switch screens. The second to load. So very important to upload your records. Um, so finish the live demo, uh, set the preferences. That's something. Um, once you're set, you should be good, unless you join some more projects. Um, so if you have your settings set to how you like them, you are all set to go out and record species in the field. Um, and then we also recorded an observation of fake species and uploaded the observation. And one note I want to make while we're on the topic of the mobile app is how important photos are. So it's really important to have clear photos so that you can really, um, so that our experts can go in and look at these records and be able to tell if it's a species um, that you reported or not. So some tips we have are you could put a hand or a sheet of paper behind the species um, to provide some scale and help your camera focus. And then, so the records, oh, sorry, I accidentally switched views. Okay. Um, so we just went through the mobile app um, and the records sort of disappeared from your phone. So if you want to see it again, um, you go to the online web application. Um, and so something, so this is where you go to the nyimapinvasive.org and sign in and then look at the map. Um, I would give you a live demo, but we are really close on time. So I'm just going to um, explain how you would do it. Um, so once you log in, um, you could use the filter tool. So that's up here. Um, and you could filter on yourself. There's a little toggle you can use to filter on yourself. Um, since we just uploaded fake records, um, you could enter in fake species for the filter, and then all of the records that we've all entered today would all pop up across the state. Um, there's all sorts of things you can filter on, like if you are interested in one of the species we learned about today, you could look at the distribution. Um, one thing to always remember when on this website is this uh, geographic layers on the side. Um, this layers on off bar is really important. So sometimes I'm looking for a record and I can't see it, and it's really just because I forgot to toggle not detected on or something like that. Um, some other things you can do online are the export report tool. So you could get a species list for a certain geography, um, for example, a county. And you can also make um, distribution maps. And uh, I just want you to be aware of where the help resources are. So we have a lot on our newyorkimapinvasive.org website. Um, we also have the New York IMAP help desk. So you can email this email here, and I will get back to you or put you in contact with someone on our team who can help you. And then we also have a, our network-wide website, imapinvasive.org slash help. Um, where there's some more help information for the IMAP and bases. And just as a conclusion slide, um, so June 24th through July 15th, we encourage you all to participate in the challenge and help us fill data gaps and support conservation of New York's natural resources. Um, so you can go out and survey for the focal species. 
And then you can report presence or not detected using IMAP and Vases, the mobile app. And you can check our leaderboard at nyimapinvasives.org to check on your standing and see how your PRISM is doing. And we'll announce the winners in mid-July. And so thank you, everyone. We really encourage you to go out and submit a record this weekend. So keep in mind what the habitat these species live in um, so you can go survey them. So for uh, water chestnut and European frog bit, you would be visiting uh, slow moving water, for example, then you'll be looking at the soil for finding areas of Asian jumping worm. And I encourage you all to stay connected with us um, so you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at NYIMAP Invasive. And at that, I thank you all for tuning in. Um, we can now enter the question period. Um, you can keep entering your questions into the chat box or you could also unmute your microphone. Um, I have my email and the website for the leaderboard for your information. Um, if you need uh, custom support, so you're having some issue with the app um, and you really need some personalized help, um, please email our inbox with your issue and any details, the device you're using, and your phone number if you'd like to talk on the phone. And uh, the IMAP team, some of us are available for some time after the webinar to help. And otherwise, if you need any help later, you can still email us and we'll respond, usually within one business day. And so now I know that we've reached our 2.30, but we will stay on for questions. Um, let's start with jumping worm questions. I know I saw one. I will just read Annis' response real quick. I can't see it anymore, but I remember it's about, um, do we have native earthworms in New York? Um, people who have seen earthworms here for all their lives. Um, those are were most likely European earthworms. So uh, native earthworms are have been relatively rare, especially compared to uh, the Euro European earthworms, um, and they're usually found, the native worms are usually found under logs, um, under rocks, along streams, and they're very rare. So most of the worms we encounter are not native. And so thank you, Annis, for giving us that overview today. So next, are there any questions about uh, frog bit? And since I'm not seeing any, I'll move to the spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. There were a couple uh, chat questions um, that I had responded to in the chat box. And um, one was uh, just a reminder of what the email address for Ag and Markets is to um, report um, the spotted lanternfly and that I did put that in the chat box. It's spotted with can fly at agriculture.ny.gov. So if you if you have any suspect that you might have seen one, then definitely let them know. And then somebody had asked about the study for the um, spotted lantern fly life cycle. And um, Michael said that he will uh, look for that. And um, you know, we can always send out, I know that we will be sending out reminders to the uh, challenge participants throughout the the next couple of weeks um, while the challenge is going on. So um, if we find that, then we can send that out to everyone. Thank you, Jen. Um, and then the last topic would be the IMAP invasive. Um, one question was, do we need to join projects for our data to be counted? And no, you do not. Uh, so you just need to report one of those four focal species during the challenge. So. July 24th through July 5th, I'm sorry, June 24th today through July 15th. Um, so those are the challenge dates. Um, and if there are any other questions, please enter them. Oh, I just saw a new question from Sherry Miller. She asks, 
am I to understand if we can eliminate spotted lanterns? Oh, sorry. Am I to understand if we can eliminate Tree of Heaven, that will help protect the incursion of the spotted lantern fly? So I'm wondering if either Michael or Jen could share their thoughts on that question. If Michael's sure, still online. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, um, with that recent research that um, found that spotted lanternfly can complete its life cycle without Tree of Heaven, um, they're, they're saying now, people are now saying that eliminating Tree of Heaven will not eradicate spotted lanternfly from the environment. So, they're actually not recommending to remove spot, um, Tree of Heaven from properties near uh, agricultural production because they can somewhat act as trap plants um, rather than um, eliminating them and then the spotted lantern flies begin to feed more on crops. Hmm. Thank you, Michael. It is still important to know where uh, Tree of Heaven is across the state because that helps us um, sort of predict and track the spread that uh, spotted lanternfly can make throughout New York. All right, are there any more questions about any of the species or IMAP invasives? It looks like there are no more questions. Um, so thank you so much everyone for joining us and thank you for your interest in the Invasive Species Mapping Challenge. Um, big thank you to all of our guest speakers today um, for their species ID training. So thank you, Anna. Stephen and Michael. Um, and I hope you all enjoy the IMAP Invasive Species Mapping Challenge and check back on the leaderboard for updates. Should be a fun challenge this year. So happy mapping everyone. I hope you enjoy the nice weather. <laughs>